All right, welcome, those who are interested. Welcome to Sound Mixing 100. Not 101 even, this is 100. This is the basic of the basics. This is where the you learn all the sort of different things and what means what and how to do everything and what matters when you're doing uh, sound mixing of this of this kind. Um, and it's important to note that um, this is just how I approach things. And um, it's important to note, too, that it changes depending on the style, depending on who you're working with, if you're not working on your own, and uh, many other factors like that. And so... Just keep everything in mind that I'm just sort of showing you the basics. This is why it's 100. I want you to know how you can attack basically any kind of mix. Because even if you're shooting for certain things, there's still certain tenets of like how to make a mix and how to get it started that can really help uh, you along your way. Now, of course, I'm using a decent DAW um, Sonar Professional. Now, there's also, of course, Reaper. Um, there's a lot of other ones, Pro Tools. But... The approach is still the same no matter what you're doing. If you're using Audacity, if you're trying to do a mix on Audacity, you'll have to sort of find some shortcuts, and I'll try to point out where you can sort of edge out in that way. But basically what I wanted to let you know is this is how you can get started. Now, this is a song that's on my uh, album, uh, Our Best Hope. It's also on my channel. It's called Rose's Rebellion, um, and you probably heard it before. It's got some extra elements going on right now that, uh, that you didn't hear in the recording that's on the channel. But um, that's important, too, because we're going to note that. Now, I'm not going to do any adjusting yet. I'm just kind of letting this mix play uh, underneath. What I completely did is I took down all of the EQs that are on, um, on any of the vocals. So there's nothing going on there. And I took down all of the compression um, and basically you know, anything that could affect the sound in a... You know, at all because I want you to know how to sort of, sort of manipulate things to make them sound how you want them to sound um, and of course give you I guess influence you on how I think things should sound because of obviously you can't get around that so one thing that's important is if you're tracking it yourself aka recording all the tracks yourself um, or even a lot of them don't get too attached to the mixes, like to like to, to tweaking things as you go I mean please do absolutely do don't get too attached to it because it's important to take a step back and do what we call faders down, which is um, these are faders. If this were a physical representation, it'd be a slightly different approach, but not much uh, than what we're doing today. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. But you do is you you take all these and you literally just zero, zero them all down and then hit play. If you're, if you're able to do this, hit play and then select everything and then just gradually pull everything up as you saw me doing when I was talking in the beginning and pull it up to, you know, something that leaves you a lot of headroom in your master, uh, master bus, you know, between, uh, you know, I would say negative 15 decibels and negative 10 decibels. Um, because it's important to me to have a good, uh, good headroom when you're doing mixing and headroom is just the amount of space between the, uh, end of the sound, like as loud as it can go, which if for digital is negative zero and, um, and you know, the quietest it could go. Now, if you're working with 24 bit, uh, depth material, you have about 192 decibels of de breathing room. So no worries on that. And uh, again, this isn't about recording. This is just about mixing. It's not about editing either. Editing is a completely other thing. So if you think those those things as part of mixing, they kind of are. But this is just about, say, you've already got the editing done and you've got the um, the things in time sounding like you want. We want Now we want the things in volume and in uh, space sounding good. So again, this is also without any reverb. Uh, reverb is an important part of mixing. I'll get to that in just a minute um, because you'll kind of hear how things sort of don't sound completely congealed, uh, as it were. It's basically being a very in-tune conductor. So you know a conductor in an orchestra basically cues parts, make sure everybody's going at the same rate, same place, and the volumes are hit right, um, and cueing them down and everything else like that. That's kind of what you're doing, except you have micromanagement control over it. So you know if you, there's a microsecond, you can adjust that volume for that microsecond and make sure that it sounds the way you want it to. So what do we have here? Well, we have a metal and rock song um, 
with bass, guitar, uh, drums, lead guitar, vocals, you know, the standard set, of, the standard complement of things. And it's important that we don't let this we'll go listen to a reference mix. It's very important to listen to a reference mix. And so this is a mastered, obviously this is a mastered um, a piece of work here by Avenged Sevenfold on the song Danger Line. And it's, you know, it's not exactly what we have because obviously you're making a new piece of media, so it's not going to be exactly, but it's important, you know, you just want to kind of like listen. And yes, again, it's mastered, so you can't take everything, like you can't necessarily get a master uh, mix up to exact master, but you you can get really close actually because honestly, a good mix only needs like just a little bit of mastering um, to get it to sound really good. And so let's listen to this. All right, so we hear the bass is is there. You can kind of hear it, but it's not too loud. The snare's pretty beefy, but not in the way. It kind of opens up here. There's plenty of space in the middle of the sound. Oh, that's because that came in there, okay. It's clipping a little bit on the speaker end, but that's okay. You can hear how the guitars here are a little bit thicker, um, partially because of how they're played, but some other things like that. Okay, so we kind of have a rough idea of what the guitars should sound like, how the bass should sit in a song of this style. Um, so the bass should be a little loud, but not too loud. Um, so you definitely want to be able to hear it, but it definitely needs to have some uh, low structure into it as well. So now we've got that. Okay, cool. So we've, we've got that listened to. That's pretty sweet. So let's see here. Where do we start? All right, so of course this is quieter, but um, so first thing we notice too is that the organ really freaking loud right now. That's not necessary. So what we can do is we're kind, you know, we've got everything even now. And we'll pull that back. Because the organ's not necessarily a main instrument, especially at this part. So we want to make sure we pull it back a little bit. That bass is really loud, if you can hear it, it's like overtaking a lot of what's going on. So what you do is you just pull that down a little bit. Now, one little tip that I've learned, um, at least for the sounds I want to get with the tones I use, if your bass is a standard rock bass setup with like a lot of high end, um, you want it to be just a couple decibels lower than the peak of your guitars. So you can kind of see that the peak of the guitars is around 23.9 where there's the bass is peaking right now around 29.5, so we can pull that up just a touch. All right, cool. So that might be a good level. We'll have to check it on some other things, because right now I'm mixing on a pair of headphones, and it's always important to check on a lot of different things. If you don't have good headphones or good speakers, check in your car, check your mixes, as many different things as possible, and take notes of what needs to be changed for each, and make sure you stick to those notes, because it's important to know um, how it, to make sure this mix sounds as good in as many locations as possible if you don't have the luxury of setting up a really good studio space for yourself, which I know a lot of people do not, so just trying to be sympathetic to that. That's the, that's a good way to start. So, And it's just a good way to get a start, like a baseline of like where your volumes want to be. Because obviously, this intro part, you know, maybe we want the organ a little louder, but I kind of want to get everything set up and sitting where I want it to. Now, one thing I noticed about these vocals is they've got a lot of um, unevenness to them, and they could use a little bit more bite to cut through our distorted guitars. So what we can do is we power on, um, we can get any sort of saturation, tube saturation plugin works. Um, just gonna add that a little bit to the verse vocals. We're gonna go back to the verse here. 
Or alternatively, you can just like, you know, add a little bit more um, like distortion and edge to it. The other thing is you notice that, well, there's a lot of spikes in these vocals. The vocals aren't very, uh, they have a lot of spikes and ups and downs and dynamics to them, which is fine. I mean, but since we want to hear every single syllable, we want to uh, compress that a little bit. So let me pull up my compressor here. All right, so now what you want is a good amount of compression on the vocals. I generally shoot for like negative five gain reduction on average, and um, there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, since there's not a lot of transients, aka like you know clappy you know type sounds like really leading tones, um, you can. Keep that in mind when you're doing your compression. Um, when you want to really hit on the transients, which is like the very early attack and very early hit and high end frequencies of a sound, you use a lower attack because um, it, you know, that's like one millisecond. Uh, like that's when it, the compressor engages at one millisecond. And then when you release, um, that's when it ends. And I usually have that pretty generously high too, for vocals anyway. This is of course a preset, um, but I'm just explaining it to you real quick. Um, peak is just, it's reading the peak. I mean, RMS is something else. Um, it's useful for some things. I only find RMS useful mostly for like um, bigger sounds. Vocals are not uh, too big. Um, so this is of course unequed vocals. Um, There we go. So we adjusted the threshold to negative 16.8 decibels. And we did that because we wanted the vocals to um, to be compressed, but we didn't want it to, to be too extreme. I sometimes really extremely, like I use a, a, a I use a um, brick wall limiter sometimes on vocals, but we're gonna try to do something a little bit more push pull here than just something really compressed. So that already sounds like it mixes just a little bit better in. Um, and now if the artist was like, yeah, cool, I want a vocal effect on there. I have a vocal effect on these vocals because I thought it sounded cool. And it also helps them punch out a little bit more. Um, and this vocal effect is called a modulator. Um, you could also do a chorus. And the modulator is really just... Um, I guess sort of like, you know, copying the effect and, and adjusting the frequency and having it like be thick and chorusy, um, which makes it sound cool, punches up the verses a little bit. Again, we're just getting some baseline um, volumes because obviously we want to be able to adjust these whenever we need to. Because, for instance, right here, man, you can't even, like, before, at least, you could hear the chorus vocals, which we're going to do the same thing with for the chorus. We're going to add the EQ, not EQ, the, um, the effects here, so that way they are nice and punchy. In. And I'll actually use a little bit extra compression on them, um, just so that they have that little edge uh, to them. Again, I'm assuming you only have pretty basic tools. I mean, you should have at least a compressor, um, at least maybe a chorus plugin. You can find all those things on kvraudio.com. Um, but let's see. So that's just a way to get started here. And honestly, like if you just had a demo that you wanted to record real quick. Now let's see. Now what you would do in like Audacity is you'd come in here and you'd make uh, manually make like a, a drop off with the volume. I know you can do that in Audacity by cutting up the clip and doing that. For this, we're just gonna hit, it's already on read. So we're gonna write the automation. And we're just gonna say, all right, we want that to do down. Cool, so that faded down maybe a little bit too much so we can hit Control Z and we'll just go, okay, we need to do that again. All 
Okay, so that end part still need to come down a little bit more, so we'll just... There we go. So that way, you can still hear what the these chorus vocals are doing, but you still get that cool scream on the bottom. And there's a couple other things you can do with reverb, which I'm not going to get into right now, because reverb to me, um, again, like it adds a lot. It does. It's important to have reverb uh, when you're doing mixing. However, um, again, I feel like a good approach is to make see how it sounds without any. If you can get it sounding pretty cohesive, and don't worry if it's not fully cohesive, because the reverb will add that. And I'll show that to you in just a moment. So... Guitars sound pretty good. And I don't think they're overtaking anything too much. The snare's pretty punchy. It could be up a little bit more. The drums as a whole, I think, could come up. So what we'll do is we'll just select all the drums for right now. And we'll just up them just a touch. Oh, now the snare's a little too loud. But that's alright, because we can just lower the snare. All right, so what were the basics? So is this mix the best? No, I mean, obviously there's a lot going into it. You can tell things are missing and still sticking out. Um, so what we can do is since I have all of the, uh, I, I use buses for my uh, reverbs. I don't have to worry about too much. I can just, oh, let's listen to it when we have all of the reverb going and see what that sounds like. Now, see, that, that already has quite a bit of space going on in it that you can really hear. And let me just turn that up real quick. Again, how good do we have this sounding without any EQ, okay? Um, and now, drums are a little different. Again, there's a lot of pre-processing you have to do with with raw drum tracks, but um, if you're using like a sampler, usually they're pre-processed for you, so they sound pretty good right out of the box. But, um, but this is like with very little EQ except on the drums, and um, it's just through the amp and, and some panning stuff. So if you have, like you're doing a rock track, you typically have, you know, left and right guitars and everything else. And like... You know. So I just wanted to prove to you all that if you have some good recordings, you don't need a lot of effects. You don't need a lot of craziness. Just a little bit of compression on some certain things. And this, I mean, this is just scratching the surface again. I just wanted to go over and show you like why it's important to start from nothing. Because you, if you have some good, if you have now, if, if you have some deficiencies that you can hear, like, you know, you have a guitar recording somebody sent you and it's lacking like low end or high end or something just out of the box. Well, adjust it using an EQ as you see fit. Um, but, I mean, again, this is just, like, none of the EQs are enabled, all of the buses are, 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 are set, you know, I, I just, I cannot emphasize enough that if you have some good recordings, you don't need to do a lot of hullabaloo, uh, with your stuff. Um, there's a lot more we can do here, but if... I just wanted to toss together a recording to show to, um, you know, a label or something else or just, you know, wanted to show to somebody as like proof of concept of what we can do. 
then I would be, you know, I think this would work. And again, not much going on here. My original has a lot of stuff going on, and uh, I can even walk through some of that as we go forward. But I just wanted to get the basis of sound mixing down for you that you don't need EQs all over the place, necessarily. You don't need reverb all over the place, necessarily. Now, and you don't need, like, there's no set rules other than you definitely have to make sure the volumes work. You have to make sure everything sounds, you can hear everything, you can clearly articulate what's going on. And it's important to check both on headphones and on speakers as much as you can. But you don't need to start automatically with slapping on some high pass EQ unless you feel like you need it. Um, I, as a habit, do because there's specific reasons for that. Um, but, you know, basically tossing it so that everything below a certain frequency or above a certain frequency on certain instruments, you just don't need. Really, you don't. Um, and it helps clear things up even, even more. But I'm not going to get into that today. I'm just showing that even if you don't have a lot of fancy EQs and everything, you can get a good sounding, you know, a pretty good sounding mix, um, you know, even if it's not perfect. So that's it. Um, it's the, that's just the basics is starting from zero, everything zeroed out and going and making, you know, turning it up just a little bit, everything all at once and making little adjustments on those so you can hear what's going on. And um, again, I just, again, I don't want to emphasize that enough. Um, I, I'll probably go over some other things, but um, thanks for the suggestion. And um, I hope, hope that this has helped you approach your mixes in a different way or, or you know, have a good solid foundation with how to approach sound mixing. Again, has nothing to do with editing, nothing to do with recording. Um, make sure you get you know, good sounding recordings. And if you have good recordings to work with, then you should be set. Um, and you know what's beautiful about this? This doesn't take that much CPU power realistically. Um, because there's not really any effects going on with the, with anything, just a little bit of compression here and there. So, all right, that's it. Um, that was 20 minutes of the basics, the basic, basic, basics of sound mixing and kind of what to listen for, um, as I went through this. I hope that you've learned a lot. If you have any more questions, I'd love to do more videos on this, um, because there, it's a very deep subject. There's a lot of resources online. So check out um, like Spectre Sound Studios, um, SM, Spectre Media Group. On uh, we'll link in the description for you. Good advice on metal and hard rock mixing. Um, there's of course the Pro Audio Files, um, PureMix.com. There's all these resources. Recording Revolution, Graham Conkren, all sorts of resources. Some of which are absolutely free. Some of which aren't. That you can check out. That will really help improve your mix and. The most important thing I've found is that if you have friends who are musicians who have a set of ears who know what to listen for, and even if you don't, show those people your early mixes so they can tell you, you know, what they think, and um, try to find folks who will tell you what they think about it, and hopefully, and you know, don't expect to get it right the first time. It's taken me, you know, eight years to get as good as I am, and even I'm not the best. So, all right, thanks so much.